far, I'd like to share a couple words. I just felt led to speak to y'all this morning, and I hope I can get through this. I've known Truett Rogers since I was five years old. I don't remember that, but he always reminded me because the first time he ever seen me was I painted his dogs green. <laughs> <clears throat> me and my older brother, my uncle was a painter, and he kept painting under his house, and uh, Truett's dogs came under there, and we painted them with green, and it won't latex paint, it was oil based. So he'd always remind me of that. But to say this right here, I got an awesome church pain. <laughs> Last night, Brian calls me, Walter, daddy's missing. His cars and trucks here, the door's open, I can't find him. I've looked the house over. What should I do? I said, call the sheriff's department, and I'll be there in a minute. I was sitting there watching TV in my drawers. <laughs> I said, I got to get dressed. <laughs> so I got dressed real quick and went over there. Laura called my nephew, Ricky, and he came over there. I said, has anybody called 911? And he said, no. I said, Ricky, call 911. He called 911 in the Dispatcher said, well, my sergeant ain't here. I can't, I can't authorize nothing about that. He said, we call East Over Fire Department. He says, I can't call nobody right now. Thank God Herman Britt calls the fire department. Call, because of this, I'm thinking, what should I do? I think about an app. I'm not a computer man. I said, I think about an app. Well, I don't know how to get in touch with the app. So I call my pastor, John. I know he's a computer man. I said, John, true, it's missing. Will you put out over the thing? We need people with lights and bodies and prayer. He puts it on the thing, it, on my phone, there it is. But the next thing I know, there's probably 50 people there. Everybody. People at home praying. I got an awesome church family. Thank you. Thank you, too. All right, let's, uh, a good Lord in prayer to start our service this morning. Dear Lord, we come before you today to praise you as God. Uh, we just praise you because of who you are. We thank you for the blessings you give us. We thank you, in fact, that you give us the opportunity to serve. Um, some things we plan, some are on a moment's notice. Um, but we thank you um, that we can pray, that we can always go to you. Lord, we thank you for the time that we had this morning to celebrate a baptism, just to celebrate worshiping you. So, Lord, we pray for your blessing on our time this morning. Pray, Lord, that all that we do brings you glory. And, um, Lord, just again, ask for your blessings on our time together. And as we seek to exalt your name, Lord, speak to each of us that we may know that we've been in your presence today. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So the saying goes that the third time is the charm. And that's the case for our baptism service today. I have had that we give Bibles to everyone that gets baptized, and I have had three Bibles on the corner of my desk since mid-July. Um, we had originally scheduled to baptize Ella and Trey and Michaela the first week of August, and the Wednesday before that's when I had my heart attack. And um, so for first calls I made Thursday morning um, was to Michaela and uh, Rebecca to say, you know, y'all can go ahead if you want to, but clearly I'm not going to be there. And um, so they decided to wait, and then we rescheduled it for January about three weeks ago. And um, in the unusual winter that we have had, um, it was one of the weeks that ICE came in. We did end up, um, we canceled because we didn't know if we had the church, that, so we had to cancel then. And um, so we rescheduled it for this morning, and we're excited about that. And then I looked at my phone Tuesday morning, and it said, freezing drizzles Sunday morning. Sunday afternoon will be fine, but it's going to be freezing drizzle Sunday morning. And unfortunately, about Wednesday, Thursday, that went away. And so I'm excited today um, that we get to baptize um, Ella and Michaela and Trey. So, Ella. Let's 
So we um, had the chance to talk to Ella uh, a couple years ago uh, when she um, prayed to receive Christ during vacation Bible school. And uh, it's been a little while since we've been able to get her in the um, baptism. So we're glad to be able to do that today. Um, but again, just excited to see what God's going to do with her and um, through her life. Ella, my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And rise unto him, you walk in newness of life. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today again just praising you as a wonderful God, thanking you for Ella and uh, her surrender of her life to you. Uh, we thank you that you called her, that she received your call, and Lord, just pray that you will bless her as she goes, uh, be with Chris and Rebecca and the rest of the family as um, they uh, continue to parent her just to give them wisdom, um, especially during the teenage and the, the trying times and beyond that come ahead, and Lord, just pray that you'll be with her to help her become what you created her to be. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. It is not often that I get to baptize a married couple. And um, I've done brothers, brothers and sisters. I've done parents with their children. Um, but I'm not, this may be the first time I've actually done a couple. I got a chance to talk to Trey and Michaela uh, a, few, a couple years ago um, and um, before they got married and we, they were um, was going to do their wedding ceremony and then Trey's granddad, or, yeah, Trey's granddad went in the hospital and um, come on over this way so they can see you too. <laughs> I know Trey's shy, but anyway, they, um, so they got married. That, that is the only wedding ceremony I've ever done next to a hospital bed. And, um, but it was important for them, for him to be there. And um, so it's been a little while since then, but we're excited now that they're able to come and to get baptized. I had a chance to talk to them about their salvation. And um, so we're just excited to uh, have a public um, display of a change that God made in their lives um, years ago. So, Kayla, my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're buried with him. We rise again to walk in newness of life. Uh, Trey, my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're buried with him. We rise again to walk in newness of life. Let's pray. I was gracious to come before you again just because of your grace and your love and your mercy that sent Jesus Christ to the cross to die for us. I thank you again, Lord, for Trey and Michaela, their surrender to you. Pray, Lord, that you will just bless them as a couple, bless them as parents, and the Lord just help them to do all that you've called them to do and to be, all that you've created them to be. And uh, Lord, we just give you the glory for it and help us as a church to support them and their walk with you. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. It is because someone took the time to share the story of Jesus that we were able to see three baptized this morning. Psalm 66, 16. Come and hear, all who fear God, let me tell you what he has done for me. I love to tell the story, it will be my theme and glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Let's stand and worship together.
want to have a time uh, just to pause in our service and pray. Uh, certainly thank you for your generosity with the Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering and just look forward to hearing about all the missionaries that will be sent overseas uh, in the coming year. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are, you are a great God. You have done great things. You continue to do great things with this church and through this church. Just thank you uh, just how you have uh, given us the opportunity to uh, see uh, three people be baptized this morning. I just pray that you continue to be with them, be with their families. Pray that they will just continue to grow in their knowledge and love of you. Uh, just thank you just for the generosity of this church that we can uh, be a part of uh, giving towards uh, missionaries overseas. I just pray that you will be with them. Uh, give them just the strength uh, and the patience, perseverance that they need uh, to minister well and uh, to all the countries that they uh, serve. I just pray that you continue to use this church, use this uh, different ministries that we have. I just pray that you use the offering that we will receive uh, this morning as well, that we would just be good stewards of what we uh, give and just, uh, just pray that you would just continue to grow and use uh, this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Romans 5, verse 8, Paul wrote these words. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Let's stand and sing those words, God so loved.
prophet Isaiah wrote these words about Jesus. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will find hope. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of nations, mighty to save. Jesus was preparing to leave the disciples, he gave them a charge, and we find it recorded in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. And then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but there were some who doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He made another promise to us as well that he will return one day. But while we're here, we've got a lot of work to do. Amen. It's so 
okay if it's hard to believe. I have faith you will do greater things. It's my time to go, but before I Don't forget the things that I've taught you. I've conquered death and I hold the keys. And where I go, you will go to someday. But there's much to do here before you leave. So When I was growing up, we had a family in our church, the Wu family, and uh, Mrs. Wu, a brilliant lady, um, but she grew up in China, and you could very much hear that in her accent as she spoke, and um, could sometimes be a challenge to understand her. You know, sometimes when people sing, their um, accent goes away, uh, but Mrs. Wu's never did. Uh, when she would sing uh, in front of our church, uh, it was always the same song. And it was always in classic Mrs. Wu, kind of hard to understand what she's saying, fashion. But the words I always remember, uh, she used to sing, send me, O Lord, send me. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today, and hopefully we'll pray about through this week and beyond, and talk about next week. Send me, O Lord, send me. When Isaiah had his call in Isaiah chapter 6, he fell before the Lord when he saw his holiness in heaven. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I come from a people of unclean lips. And they touched his lips to symbolically cleanse him. And they said, who shall we send? And Isaiah said, send me, O Lord, send me. And one of the reasons why I wanted us as we were transitioning from our 40-day prayer challenge into Missions Emphasis Week, and I like the way the calendar set up, that should be one of the things we're praying for. Lord, what is it you want me to do? God, what is the plan for my life? Our church mission statement is helping individuals reach their potential in Jesus Christ from seeds from the time we're born as Christians to cedars until we're fully grown and multiplying and reaching other people. And so my hope and my prayer is that in this next 
especially during the next week, but even beyond that, um, that you will pray seriously and um, understand that our salvation is not about going to heaven. Our salvation is not about the benefits that we receive here on earth. Our salvation is not about our prayer life. Our salvation is about the glory of God who can take sinful man through his son's death on the cross, raise him from the dead so that we can be brought into relationship with a holy and almighty God, not because of who we are, but because of who God is and who Jesus Christ is. If you would, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, and we are going to be looking at um, the, the first few verses of this chapter. Uh, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then as a follow-up, wrote the Gospel, or wrote the book of Acts. And they really are, should be taken together. Uh, the themes from one book roll into the other. Now John, and we're going to read some from John later today, but John gives us the most teaching about the Holy Spirit and what, it, it, what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is. But Luke and Acts actually have the most instances and references to the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and so Luke writes these two books together, uh, one to explain the things of Jesus, and then now to talk about how Jesus is still here just in the Spirit instead of in the flesh. In fact, uh, one of the commentaries I was reading as I teach through the book of Acts uh, this semester, and um, one of the commentaries I was reading talked about the fact that really, um, some people say this should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit, uh, some people should be called the Acts of the Apostles, and you can debate which of those are right, and he said basically it's the Acts of Jesus, because that's the point of Luke, is that we saw the first half while he was living, and now we see the church beyond that, through Christ sending the Holy Spirit. So God's Word says, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, I wrote this narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, again, we come before you praising you as our creator praising you as our Redeemer and praising you as the one that sustains us into eternity and through eternity. We thank you, Lord, for the book of Acts. We thank you for the writings of Luke, your Holy Spirit leading him to write that. Lord, I pray today that as we look at this small part of the text, that you will, through the truth of your word and the power of your spirit, speak to each of us. Lord, let there be less of me, more of you. And let the words that penetrate our hearts, our minds, and our soul be you speaking to us so that when we respond to how you speak to us, we can and will give you the glory for it. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The power of the Holy Spirit provides us the strength to tell others how Jesus impacted our lives. When we think about a witness, we spoke about focus on a witness. A witness tells you what they've been through, what they see, what they know. And the Holy Spirit gives us the power, provides us the strength to tell others how Jesus impacted our lives. God gives us the power to do that. So we're going to walk through, there's really three stories, three sections to this. And so just for each section that we look at, we're going to hopefully find a lesson and something that we learn um, about Christ and about the fact that we shall be witnesses. That, that's the title of our sermon today. We shall be witnesses. And so, as we begin, since I wrote this narrative, Theophilus. Now, Theophilus means lover of God. Uh, some people would say that it's not an actual person. He was writing this to the church. But if we go back to Luke, uh, he wrote it to most honorable Theophilus, which indicates it was probably someone in the Roman uh, hierarchy or a soldier that he was writing to. And so it was indeed a specific person. And uh, it's often, that is not a common Roman name, and so many people believe, as several people would do, they would change their names at their baptism. Uh, so some believe that Theophilus did that to take on a Christian name from his Roman name, and that's who Luke is writing to. I do want to say really quick, I heard my whole life, so I, I just, went, I'm always compelled to say this when I talk about the book of Acts, and um, I, when I grew up, 
Everybody used to say that Paul's name changed when he got saved, right? He went from, from Saul to Paul, all right? If you've ever heard that, the person that told you that is absolutely wrong. I had a student one time in a class, I said that, and they're like, oh, and they flipped out. That's not right. Paul's name, he started using the name Paul after they were, had their hands laid upon them so that they were going to be missionaries. Paul was going to be the one, Paul was the one that God chose to take the name to the Gentiles, and so he used his Gentile name. He likely had both Saul and Paul actually his whole life because he had a Jewish mother and a Roman father, and so he took the name Paul, and we never saw it written that way until he became a missionary. So now, you know something a lot of people have been mistold their entire life. All right, um, so Paul, so we're getting to deliver, not to Paul yet, so he gets to Theophilus until the day it's written, so taking the name this one, at the t- he was likely took it at the time of his salvation, um, but not like Paul. Uh, until the day he was taken up. So here we see Jesus was taken up, and we'll see what he says in a few moments, and we'll see some more about that as we go through uh, this passage. Um, he, he'd given orders through the Holy Spirit. So it's interesting, he had given orders, even Jesus was given orders through the Holy Spirit, through God, to the apostles that he had chosen. God chose the apostles. They didn't choose Jesus. Jesus told them that. I have chosen you. You haven't chosen me. I, I, don't, I don't wake up one day and decide, hey, I'm going to become a Christian. If I wake up one day and feel like I'm going to get saved and I'm going to receive Christ as my Savior, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And there is nothing I can do in my body, in my flesh, or who I am that is good enough to offer God anything for my salvation. I have nothing to offer. Only Jesus Christ was, will, was able to offer a sacrifice that was pleasing to God. The old sacrificial symbol was a system was a picture that we needed sacrifice, but only Jesus was the one true sacrifice. And so our salvation and our jobs to be apostles, which means sent out ones, and we're all sent out, my ability to do anything with God, to have God work in my life, comes through His power and not mine. After he suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs. I remember the day he saw them. He showed them the scars. And uh, we always, I, I, just another thing, by the way, that drives me a little crazy at times, is we always pick on doubting Thomas, right? Because he didn't believe Jesus until he saw the, the scars uh, himself, right? Do you realize the other disciples were exactly the same way on that first day of the week when Jesus appeared to them? And they didn't believe that it was Jesus resurrected until they saw the scars. So don't just bang on Thomas. It was all of them. You just never know where it's going to go once I get started. <laughs> Appearing to them during the 40 days, seeking, the, seeking and speaking about the kingdom of God. Basically, they had 40 last days for Jesus to speak. It was the fact of the resurrection. The apostles, one of the convincing proofs was that they saw the scars. That led them to believe. Remember in John when they talk about that, Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are you who have seen and believe, but even more blessed are those who haven't seen and yet still believe. And so as we start this text, as we, as we begin the passage, as we start uh, and look at the beginning of the book of Acts, the question is, do I believe that Jesus Christ raised from the dead? Do I believe that he took on my sin? Paid the price. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. All of us have sinned. Do I believe with all of my heart, soul, and mind that he, Jesus raised from the dead, that God raised him from the dead? The disciples got to see proofs. Now, y'all, I, I talked to Perry, Perry Mason a couple weeks ago, so I'm going to talk about Ben Matlock today. Um, that's my other favorite lawyer show. And in the first couple of seasons, you give me any scene, and I can pretty much tell you the whole plot. And... Um, one of my favorite ones is um, David Ogden Stiers is a blind guy, and um, so he figures out how to shoot this guy coming down the steps, and what he did was he put a, a piece of stationery so that when the guy stood on the stationery coming down the steps when the power had gone out, he'd hear the paper, paper crumble, and when he did that, he would know to shoot him, and he could kill him, and his plan worked fine. So how is it that you're going to suspect a blind man that he killed somebody? And in classic Matlock fashion, it's one of the reasons I always laugh at the show, is it just happened that that stationery was bought that day so the only person whose fingerprints could be on the stationery when it was thrown in the trash can was the killer. And so they had the proof that it was David Ogden Stiers. 
I love Matlock. Stuff always happens the day of, so you can narrow it down. But there's proof. You know that it's true. We don't get to see the resurrection. We don't get to see the person of Jesus. But as we begin to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and what God does through the Spirit, we are witnesses to what God has done in our life if we are a believer in Jesus Christ. If I am a Christian, it's because I have come to the point in my life that I believe that Christ died and rose again. I believe that my sins were paid for 2,000 years ago. Well, before I was born, Christ died on the cross, and I have to believe that it was my sins that were there. And that when Christ, when Christ died, he paid the sin debt, and when he raised, sin no longer has a hold on me. Death no longer has a hold on me, and I will live forever in the presence of God when I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And so I have to believe what God has said about that. Now, the people then did have more convincing proofs, and we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15 in detail later in the spring, but I just want to read the beginning of it uh, this morning. Just again, this idea that there's proof at that time that Christ risen from the dead. Now, brothers, I want to clarify for you the gospel I proclaim to you. You received it and have taken your stand on it. You are saved by it if you hold the message I proclaim to you. But holding doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. It means if it truly took root. Think about the parable of the seeds. If it truly takes root, you're saved by it. Unless you believe for no purpose, which means like the, we the weeds that got choked out. Um, so if, we, if it holds to us, then we're saved. For I pass on to you what is mo most important that I also receive. That Christ died for our sins, all part of God's plan because it's according to the scriptures. That he was buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that appeared to Cephas, who's also Peter. Then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive. But some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. That's Jesus' half-brother. Then to all the apostles. Last of all, to one abnormally born, he also appeared to me. Paul says, there is physical proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 500 people saw him at once. There was um, proof that Christ rose from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is real. And that is the essential element of our salvation that we have to believe. That Christ died, paying the price for my sins. That he died for that purpose. And that when he rose again, God raised him from the dead. I no longer have a sin debt because Jesus took that burden for me. And I can now live forever with him through the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in me at the time of my death salvation i must believe in the resurrection of jesus christ have you come to that point that you know that you know that you know that jesus christ is your lord and savior because that is the way we know we're saved that is what will guide and direct our life if jesus is my lord if jesus is my master it will guide my life from that point forward so there's the fact of the risen Jesus. Next we're going to see the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This he said is what you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So John baptized with water. It, it was a symbol of water baptism, was a picture of purifications of sin, that you sought forgiveness uh, and so you would wash just as an outward symbol, much as we do with baptism, what we did this morning is an outward symbol of an eternal, internal change. All right, it's also eternal, but I meant to say internal. So it's an outward symbol of an internal change. And so that's just the picture, that we die, and then God raises us from the dead. He goes, so you've heard about the baptism of John, picture of purity the Jews would treat it as, but now you baptize with the Holy Spirit. Because when we get saved, what happens is God's Holy Spirit is sealed in us at the time of our salvation. I didn't do anything to save myself. I can't do anything to lose my salvation. The question is, is it genuine? Am I really saved? And so God sends the Holy Spirit to be with me. Jesus reminds them that this is what I've told you about. I've told you uh, about the Holy Spirit. So I want to go back, and we're going to look at several passages real quick, and I'm just going to try to read through them. I'll say try because, well, y'all know me. Um, we'll start in John 14. Um, this is Jesus last night with the disciples. Beginning in verse 15, and all these are about it. So when Jesus says, I've told you about the Spirit, this is the same Spirit that's in each of us if we're a believer. And so the promises made to the disciples are the same promises we have. All right? If you love me, you will keep my commands. See, if I want to be obedient, 
I didn't get through a verse where I stopped. Sorry. Um, if, I'm, if I'm going to be obedient, it comes not from my willpower. It comes from living under the direction and power of the Holy Spirit. If you love me and keep my commands, and I will seek and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. That's the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. Anytime we are saved, we're not orphans. The presence of Jesus Christ is sealed in us to mark us for the return of Christ and to guide us and direct us and to use us for his purposes. We skip down to chapter 15 of John near the end of chapter 15. It says, when the counselor comes, the one I will send you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. So the spirit of truth proceeds from the Father, sent by Jesus Christ, sealed in us. He, the spirit, will testify about me. He'll teach us about God. He'll give us instructions about God. He'll help us to understand who God is. You will, you also will testify, so we will testify, and we'll see that again as we go through our text in Acts. You also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. So they're going to do it because they know him, but we're going to have that same Holy Spirit within us. Skip down into John chapter 16. But now I'm going away to him who sent me, and not one of you asked me, where are you going? Yet because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away, because if I do not go away, the counsel will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. Jesus is saying, Jesus in a physical body can be at one place at one time. When the disciples begin to disperse and spread the gospel, Jesus can't be with all of them, because Jesus, having allowed himself to be in one place, can only be one place at a time. But he says, I am sending the Holy Spirit who will be with you. So it is to your benefit that I go away. When he comes... He will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. He'll convict the world about sin because they do not believe in me. So I'm going to be convicted about sin. That's how I become a Christian. I realize my need for a Savior, that I need forgiveness. He'll convict about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. He's going to convict us about the righteousness we need. So convict us about sin. We need a Savior. Convict us about righteousness so that we live under the power of the Holy Spirit. God will lead us to holiness. I can't earn God's righteousness by the good I do. I will live a righteous life when I allow God to direct me and I submit to his authority and to his direction. So about sin for salvation, about righteousness uh, for living now, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So he's going to teach us about judgment to know that it's settled. Jesus Christ is going to return. Jesus Christ is going to establish his kingdom. Jesus Christ is going to be with us. And so the, the, the ruler of this world, Satan, the power he has in this world, that's already been judged. It's settled. Christ won through his death and resurrection. And so that judgment is sealed. One last passage. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will give you also, he will give you into all the truth. But he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what it is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from me what is mine and will declare it to you. That's just the start of what we know about what the Holy Spirit gives us when it comes upon us. This is the one that Jesus says, this is coming to you. Go and wait. The disciples had to wait to the day of Pentecost. We don't have to wait. If we know Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, all the different names that we see used, sealed in me from the time of my salvation. Sealed in me. Sealed because I've been convicted of sin. Sealed in me to help me to live a life of righteousness. Sealed in me until the judgment comes. God desires that we walk with him. So here's what I want us to understand as we look at these two verses. I have, we have the power to share about Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has given you the power to share? about Jesus. 
I heard a statistic a number of years ago, 80% of people that faithfully attend church, evangelical Christians, will never share the gospel of Jesus Christ with another person. That's a sad statistic. We should be telling people about Jesus. We should be talking about Jesus in our life. Not because of what I can do, but because God gives me the power. Do I have enough faith to believe that God gives me the power to share about Jesus Christ? We often talk about righteousness and our mind goes to the things that we uh, had done that we're not supposed to. Right? The, the, the do not, thou shall not. But part of being righteous is doing all that God commands me to do. Am I going to do everything that God calls me to do? Because to not do what God's laid on my heart is sinful. God has given me the power. If God calls me, he will equip me. The fact of the risen Jesus, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel, to Israel at this time? And so, so now, like, hey, hey, Jesus, now that you've been with us 40 days, is now the time, is the end of the world really coming right now? And as Jesus often does with disciples' questions, he never answers directly what you think he would be. In fact, if we were to look at this last response in detail, um, there, there's like four different interpretations of it that you can read it as. But we're going to talk about the main things that you hear. So they're, they're like, okay, is, is now the time? And, and the simple answer is, it's clear by Jesus' answer that the answer is no, because there's work to be done. It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. It's not for us to know. Because let's, let's be honest, we're human. If God says, I'm going to come July 31st of 2022, what would we do? We'd make sure we were right on July 31st, 2022 and we probably wouldn't worry about it until then if we knew the time it would shape us way too much we don't need that knowledge what God wants us to do is to live with a sense of expectancy to know that he can come back any time and live today as if it's my last opportunity to serve him and give myself completely to him so are they asking is this the time this is not for you to know the time that the father has sent by his own authority but so here's the deal. So you, it's not going to end now. You don't need to know the times. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. I like, as much as I like my HCSB translation, I like it in the other versions when it says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall. Now the reason I like that better, Dr. Black, my um, seminary professor for New Testament, um, talked about, and he's wrote a bunch of books, great author, great man, and uh, he's a brilliant dude. And um, he talked about when you sign a contract, there's a big difference in language between, will. we th kind of think will and shall is the same thing, and he's like, not in a contract. He goes, shall is something you don't have any choice on. And that's really how we should look at this. When the power of the Holy Spirit, when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall. You can't help it. It should be natural to me that I tell others about Jesus. It should be natural to me that when God's power has come upon me that it is so evident and so obvious in my life, but I can't help but speak later on. Uh, in Acts, Peter and John get arrested. They say, we can't help but speak of the things we've seen and heard. I can't help but talk about things that impact my life. I have grandchildren, if you don't know that. Why do you know I have grandchildren? Because I talk about it. Why do I talk about my grandchildren? Because I love them. Should I not naturally even more talk about Jesus Christ because I love him more and he is my master and my savior? The power is there when the Holy Spirit comes upon me. I shall be his witnesses in Jerusalem, which means locally. Judea and Samaria, which is the, the, the state or country uh, that Jerusalem is in. Samaria is next to it. It's not just expanding geographically here, but Samaria is to remind us. Uh, remember the Jews hated the Samaritans more than they hated the Romans? Uh, they were the dogs, and so we're supposed to share the gospel that don't look like us, act like us, or are like us, because we're supposed to share the gospel with everybody. D don't leave Samaria as just 
a geographic description. Luke could have just as easily and Jesus could have just as easily said Egypt and gone the other direction. He picked Samaria. Because my job is to help share the gospel where I live in the region around me to those like me and those that are not like me. And to the ends of the earth. It's interesting, by the way, in verse 8, when it talks about the witness, that John MacArthur says this, so many Christians sealed their wit- so many Christians sealed their witness to Christ with their blood that matures, which is actually the Greek word for witness, came to mean martyrs. So they took the Greek word witness and it became martyrs because so many Christians were willing to die to speak about Jesus Christ. You know why they did that? Because they had power that came from the Holy Spirit. And their concern was not about their life on this earth and in this world. It was about the things to come. It was about Jesus Christ and who he is. Peter and John, untrained, uneducated men. But the Pharisees knew when they spoke, the Sadducees, the, the, the dream team, the Sanhedrin, all the religious leaders, they knew that they had been with Jesus. They spoke with boldness. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Every one of the Gospels gives some type of um, Great Commission. Uh, This is the fifth Great Commission out of the book of Acts. I want to look at the one real quickly from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, The last words in chapter 8 from the book of Matthew says this, beginning in verse 18. Or, yeah, verse 18. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. So Jesus says, I have authority. I've already promised you I'm sending the Holy Spirit. I'm already promised I'm going to be with you wherever you go. So that authority that I'm giving you, go, which is a participle, which means be intentional. Abraham gets up and goes to the land God's going to show him. That's the same word there, Greek to Hebrew. It's the same word that's used. So it's uh, go, be intentional, therefore, because I have authority. Go, be intentional, therefore, and make disciples. That's the verb. We are to make disciples. So we're intentional, make disciples, of all nations, by the way, all nations once again, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's evangelism. We wanted the picture of death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we baptize. The, the actual Greek word means baptize leads, needs to dunk or to immerse. And so that's why we baptize by immersion. And so it's the picture of me dying and raising again, just like Christ did. So that's the evangelism portion. But not just that, teaching them, third participle, teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you. So not only is my job to help people come to know Christ, but it's also to help people grow. That's how we make disciples. We help people grow as disciples. It's not about getting someone saved and then forgetting about them. No, it's about helping someone get saved and then helping them grow into their potential in Jesus Christ. From seed to cedars. And then at the end, remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit's with you. It's sealed within you. My presence is with you. It's my authority, and I give it to you. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we think of these verses, I must be intentional about the ministry that God has for me. I must be intentional about the ministry that God has given me. I cannot walk in right relationship with God. I cannot expect God to answer my prayers and to bless me if I am not walking in righteousness with him. If we had someone that we knew was living in obvious sin, all of us would think, no, well, no, I wouldn't expect God to answer their prayers because they're living in obvious sin. But when I don't do what God is calling me to do, That sin is every bit as obvious to the Father. It may not be to the world. It may not be to those around me. But it's every bit as obvious to the Father as the sins I'm trying to avoid. I cannot be in right relationship with God if I am not serving Him. It's impossible. I wish I could say it stronger. I wish... I could say it in a better way. I I wish I had the words to say it. But if we're not about the business of God, we are living in sin. 
the Holy Spirit comes upon me, I shall, I will. God is going to overflow from me so that I tell others. When I am not sharing the gospel, when I am not sharing what God's doing in my life, I am not being what God has called me to be. When I am not serving, I am not being what God created me to be. When I am not doing what God wants me to be, this church and no church can be what God desires it to be. My faith must be acting action-based. It's not about talking a good game. It's not about praying 15 minutes a day and then doing what I want to for the other 23 hours. It's about submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ and telling people who he is. Are you doing it? And if most of us are honest, we know the answer is no. I must be intentional about the ministry God has for me. I've always said one of the biggest challenges of being a pastor or a parent. They come in the same. God's our Father. Same deal. Is you can't tell your kids what to do. The older they get. Right? You wish you could. As a pastor, I wish I could make some decisions for y'all. I can't do it. I... It, hard to see people you love and know they're not wholeheartedly surrendering to Jesus Christ. It's hard to see people that you care about and know their eyes are more on the world than they are on God. Because we should all be about the mission of God. We should all be about making disciples and the power comes to do that. Not from me. Not because I'm worthy. Not because I can do anything. I can only do things through the power of the Holy Spirit and what God does. And when God calls you to something that you say, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Not because of you, but because of God. God will not call you if he's not going to prepare you and give you the ability to do it. So when you feel that nudge of what you're supposed to do, then do it. Because God will give you the strength and the power, the power of the Holy Spirit, the fact of the risen Jesus, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the returning Jesus. The promise of the returning Jesus. I was going to stop at verse um, 8, because that's really the, the, the key verse of the whole book of Acts is verse 8, and I was going to stop there, but I really, I, I think that, that hopefully we see this next passage as encouragement. After he said this, he was taken up. As they were watching, with a cloud took them in their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven. All right, now let me just tell you. If I'm there, and Jesus starts going up, and he's in a cloud, he's still moving up, I can promise you I'm still gazing. Because there's no way I'm looking away from that, right? So while he was going up, Gazing into heaven, suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them, angels, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you in heaven will come again in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. You've seen him go up. He's going to come down the same way. But here's the lesson in that. If all I do is look to Jesus as he's going up, and wait for his return because I'm tired of dealing with this world. If all I do is look to Jesus because I want him to answer the issues in my life and to settle things for me, I'm missing the boat. Jesus ascended to go to the right hand of the Father so that he could send the Holy Spirit to seal us until he does come back as he went up and give me the power to do his work here. That's where he is. He's at the right hand of the Father. Seated at the right hand of the Father, intercessing, praying for me. Isn't that a great promise? Jesus is going to come back. 
General Douglas, Arthur, Douglas MacArthur, right, said, I shall return. And eventually, he did. But the return of Jesus is going to be so much greater. Jesus is coming back. Will I be prepared for that? Will I be serving him when he comes? Revelation 19, verse 11, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider was called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war and righteousness. His eyes were like a firing flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one else except himself. He wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the Word of God. John wrote this, by the way, and in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So clearly the Word of God is Jesus. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty, and he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is coming again. Am I prepared for that? Am I helping other people prepare for that? Am I doing the ministry and the work God calls me to do? I have a mission until the day I die or until the day Christ returns. And Buffalo shared with us a couple Sunday nights ago. Hope you don't mind me sharing your story. Um, her mother had to go to a nursing home. And her mother, as many go to a nursing home, was like, why am I still here? Why is God keeping me? What's my purpose? And one of the ladies there that was her nurses or nurses aide said, um, you know, you've been able to witness to your family, the people in your community. Maybe God's put you here so that you can witness to the people here. And she became known as the one to go to for prayer. In the nursing home, her ministry hadn't ended. God was still using her. What's our excuse? What excuse am I using that I am not involved in the ministry of Jesus Christ? It's not enough to be a good person. I'm not good enough. It's not good enough to just do the right things. It's not about the action about who I am in Christ and when his power comes upon me I will be a witness I will say what he has done in my life I have a mission I have a purpose in my life we are launching what we call the Acts 1-8 initiative because I'm an accountant and there's not creativity in me so we just call it the Acts 1-8 initiative and the goal is for us as individuals for us as a church to have a greater vision of how I can be engaged in ministry what is it that God is calling you to do we have actually set aside money in the budget this year for the express purpose of helping people do a ministry that they're called to that if it takes money I may not take money I shared a couple weeks John Brewington is leading uh, high school uh, senior is leading men's high school basketball on Monday night. That doesn't cost any money. That's just they come up here and he does the Bible story. He does it all himself because that's what God's put on his heart. We have a backpack ministry program started by Care and then Avery carries it to a whole new level. Lynn keeps it going now. Uh, it's a great ministry. It's, it's ministry that people have come up with. The Good News Club. I remember my first or second year here. We talked. We brought down Jason Murray from up in High Point and he talked about the Good News Club and nothing. Nobody said a word about it. It kind of died there until a few years later. A couple ladies got the vision to start a good news club. And so now we're doing that. That's the ministry. We're helping them in the office to get that done. What's your ministry? And we want to help you do it. Maybe it's going to be eventually going to Romania. Maybe when we get a chance, it'll be good to Montana. Whatever it is, what is God calling you to do? And how are you going to act on it? Because being a Christian and walking with God is more than just surviving life. It is more than just going day to day. It is being used by the power of Christ to change the world for his glory. We want a global vision. I'm so excited about the Lightman Christmas offering. That, by the way, we're going to do a bulletin board over here. It's going to be talking about the one act, eight emphasis, and we're going to list different things that people are doing or that we do as a church. And one of them is going to be that we do the Lightman Christmas offering great to give we want to be praying and giving 
But writing a check's not enough. It's got to be part of who I am. What am I doing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? I love the story in 2 Kings 7. Jerusalem surrounded. They, um, basically, there's no food, no water. They're basically, the city's assuming they're going to die. And um, there's four lepers. And these four lepers are trying to hide from the, the, the Aram armies. And so they go to Jerusalem and, well, there's no food. There's nothing they can do. Nobody, they're lepers, so nobody's going to give them anything. And so they basically get together and say, hey, let's just go to the Aram camp. And they might kill us, but that's better than just dying here of starvation. And they get to the camp. And God had caused confusion with the army. He had won the battle for Jerusalem, and they'd all left. So here's four guys where armies have been. Enough, by the way, to change the economy of Jerusalem the next day uh, because there was so much wealth in this camp. And they go there, and what do you do if you're starving, and you're thirsty, and there's gold everywhere? They ate, and they drank, and they were merry. Right? Isn't that what you would do? But one of them says this. It's not right that there's so much treasure and we're not telling other people. And they go and tell the city of Jerusalem to come out and check, and that's why there's so much wealth there that the economy changed in one day. It's not right that we as believers receive the blessings that God gives us and we keep them to ourselves. It is not right that we have the source of eternal life and we don't share it with the lost and dying world around us. It is selfish. It is sinful. It is against the will of God. We get great blessings from God. If nothing else, we get to spend eternity with Him. And that's plenty. But the challenge for me is what mission does God have for me? What service is God calling me to? We have too many blessings to have the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God residing in us to not share with others. Can you bow your heads with me? Before I pray, I just want to give you a chance to hear God speak. We have through January been taking three to five minutes of just prayer. Well, today, we're not going to do that. We're going to do a normal invitation here. But I want you to begin to think. Begin to hear God and what he wants you to do. not to sing these words unless they are the prayer of your heart. The altar's open. I'll be down front if you want to speak with me. This time it's about responding to God. Be genuinely in a heartfelt response. Surrender all. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you as God. We thank you for your word. Speak to us. Give us the wherewithal to follow through. Give, give it us the power. Help us to allow you to work. Speak during this time. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, I pray.
love offering for the mission trip to Romania. And um, then when we, um, Josh was going to say a prayer for that and go ahead and pray a benediction for us. And then when he, um, after we sing our song of celebration, you'll be dismissed.